September presentation, our guest speakers for today are Michael Pratt and Emma Beachy. The, they will be speaking to us about the Portage Lake Bridge. Michael Prass is a Michigan Tech alumnus with a master's degree in structural engineering. Originally from Holly, Michigan, he currently works for Fire Tower Engineered Timber, where he specializes in traditional heavy timber design. His passion for history is what led him to complete this project of getting the Portage Lake Bridge on the National Historic Register in his graduate year of college, along with his good friend, Emma. Emma Beachy is also a Michigan Tech alumna with a master's degree in structural engineering. She currently lives in Oregon and works for Corbin Consulting Engineers as a structural engineer. In her free time, she loves to be outdoors and tries to spend most weekends backpacking, hiking, or tide pooling on the Oregon coast. Without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to them. Thanks, Rebecca. Michael, do you have the presentation queued up? Yes. All right. All right, so first of all, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, like Rebecca said, we're going to be talking about the Portage Lake Bridge and um, focusing on it from the perspective of the ASC Historic Civil Engineering Landmark and what makes it worthy of that award. Um, I'm Emma and I'll be presenting with Michael, but we also want to make sure we gave a shout out to Dr. Tess Alborn, who was our advisor when we were graduate students at Michigan Tech and is really the reason that this project happened at all. Next slide, Michael. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so yeah, to start out, we're going to go through some basic facts about the bridge, mm -hmm. talk about the ASC Historic Civil Engineering Landmark Award and what went into the nomination package for that. And then we'll talk about the history of the Portage Lake Crossing, history of the current bridge, and then some unique features of the bridge from both a civil engineering perspective and a social and economic perspective. So the Portage Lake Bridge is located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, bridging between the main part of the peninsula and the Keweenaw Peninsula in between the cities of Houghton and Hancock. It was built in 1959 and is a double deck vertical lift bridge with a span length of 260 feet, tower height of 188 feet above the piers, and as of 2016, an average daily traffic of 25,000. So as I mentioned earlier, um, Michael and I got involved in this project of getting the lift bridge nominated for an ASC National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark list um, as part of our graduate studies with Dr. Alborn. She approached our bridge design class and asked if anybody would be interested in getting a nomination package together for what is a local bridge in the Michigan Tech community. Um, and we were successful in putting together this nomination package and getting the award, which was super awesome. And then through the process of submitting the award, we also had to contact ASC Michigan and they asked that we also submit the bridge for the state historic version of this award. Um, we we're also successful in getting that award. So we're really happy to hear that. Um, these packages involved a lot of information on historic significance of the bridge, uh, unique features and then comparable projects, and then also how the project contributed to the civil engineering profession and how it contributed to the nation or larger region. And then one of my favorite parts of the project was all the supplementary documents that we were able to dig up. We spent a lot of hours in the Michigan Tech archives. Um, we got to interview a couple of different people who actually worked on the bridge. And so then we collected all that information with a lot of historic photos and were able to submit that to uh, ASC. So now we'll kind of go into what uh, each of the categories that we had to submit um, in presentation format and kind of walk through our package essentially. Um, so kind of how to start is to give some context as to why the bridge is there, because um, some people may not know the history of the area and why it's important. Um, so the Keweenaw Peninsula is the location of the nation's first mineral boom. It happened in the mid 18, started in the mid 1840s and it actually happened before the gold rush out west. So it was really the first time people ran to a boom location for mineral deposits. Um, it was very rapid growth and almost immediately the Keweenaw produced 
almost all of the U.S.'s copper and a large percentage of the world's copper. Um, the QAnon led production all the way into the late 1800s and still was a big player in the U.S.'s production into the early 1900s. Mining went well into the 1970s with some straggling uh, mines going all the way into the 90s. And some are even looking at opening now again. So now the kind of the history of that portage crossing, um, as, you can, as you might have seen on that map before, um, there are mines all over the peninsula, but there's also a canal that kind of cuts through. So people have needed to cross this body of water it's pretty much since the beginning. So there's been a few different ways that they've done it. Um, the very first way was just kind of a boat ferry service. Um, this was down, done in like 1850. And then that started to be a little too ineffective. And so they actually developed a floating bridge, which was kind of a, a gondola style. So it was kind of float and cable across. Um, then they built a wood swing bridge. You can see that in the topmost photo. Um, the earliest version only had a single deck and it was designed for animal carts and pedestrians to go across. Um, keep in mind it's 1875, so not a lot of transportation modes at that time. Um, but then they adapted it to have a double deck for rail in the middle picture there. Uh, so the trains would ride on the lower levels, and then you'd have whatever carts and such you needed for the top. And then it would swing in the middle to allow boats to go through. In 1895, they uh, upgraded it to be a steel yeah, swing bridge. Yeah. Um, and uh, okay, so they upgraded to be a steel swing bridge, but it had a wood span, and then they replaced the wood span a few years later to be all steel. And you can see it in the bottom most picture there. Um, it was actually rebuilt twice because it was hit by a boat at one point and tipped over, as you can see in this photo here. Uh, that actually happened in 1905, so they had to rebuild the swing span. Um, so we had a swing bridge. It worked for quite a long time. Um, so why did they need to replace it? It was structural deficient, so it had failing foundations. It, uh, one of the reasons was because they had to dredge out one of the sides because uh, larger ships were coming through, so they needed to make the canal deeper. But in doing so, they actually undermined the foundation, and so the whole bridge would slant to one direction. Um, to the point where they had to cut off pieces of one end and add to the other side, otherwise it would rub. Um, the members were rotting and there was concrete that would fall onto the rail deck below. It was said that they would have to spray the whole bridge, at least a swing span, with water from the fire department on hot days because the steel would expand and get the bridge stuck if it was too warm. It was geometrically deficient because it had narrow lanes um, yeah, for the snow vehicles and any large trucks to get across. They actually had to close traffic to both directions because the, narrow, the lanes were too narrow that a, a normal sized truck could not go across while there was traffic going the other direction. The, it needed to open for all boats to go through no matter how tall because it was only the bottom of the bridge was only like three to five feet above the water and the, the openings themselves were narrow uh, to the point where it was getting dangerous for boats, large boats to go through. And then just the fact of increased traffic of all of these uh, different modes made the bridge very inefficient. So to address this, um, the one of the uh, Houghton County commissioners started looking into uh, what can we do about this bridge problem back in the 1940s. Um, there were different bridge solutions proposed. They, they proposed making a different bridge kind of east of where the existing swing bridge was. They proposed doing different types of bridges. Um, a fixed bridge unfortunately wouldn't gain enough clearance because it's kind of at the bottom of a valley and the towns are out are down by the water so it wouldn't be able to be wouldn't be able to get enough clearance for boats to go underneath 
Um, it was too long for a Baskell bridge. And so those typically have like a span of, um, I think it's like 150 feet whoops, um, or so. And our bridge goes farther than that. And then a swing bridge is what they had, but it was ineffective, clearly. Um, in 1953, they finally decided on designing a lift bridge. Um, this, they were finally able to get the funding because it was deemed an unreasonable, or the original swing bridge was deemed an unreasonable obstruction to free navigation of the waterway. And then 1956, the engineering started. Um, not too long after that, they began construction in December of 1957. Um, if anyone's ever been to the Kiwana, this is actually kind of significant because they actually started in winter, which is quite a feat in itself because winter is not kind in that area. Um, they worked year round and the first set or the first stage of the project was from winter of 1957 to 1958, where they worked on the foundations. The foundations were a combination of caissons and piers. And so how the caisson works is they build a sand island, which you can see in the top right picture there. Then they build a, uh, oh, that's out in the middle of the water, and they build a concrete structure on top of the sand island, which you can see in the photo just below it. Um, and this is basically going to be the base of the foundation. And so the goal of this is instead of having to excavate just a big hole, they would instead try and sink this big foundation. Uh, on the picture to the left of uh, the caisson foundation, you can kind of see that it has hollow areas on the inside. And what they do is they basically go down and clear out the material that's on the inside of the, of the caisson to the point where it starts to sink. And they just keep doing this and doing this and building up on top of the, the caisson to build up the foundation until in our case it was sunk 70 feet below the water to bedrock. Um, the this entire caisson is then full, filled with concrete and the piers are built on top. They had to do three of these out there and then the others were just normal piers. In February of 1959 they finally had the steel components arrive and started erecting those. They Field riveted everything, and this was one of the last major named bridges in Michigan to actually use field rivets. The lift span was built separate to allow full operation of the swing bridge, which we'll learn more about uh, later. Um, but that was also a unique feature for the bridge construction at the time. Um, in 1959, later that year, it, the lift span was floated into place. Uh, they closed the waterway for one day and immediately lifted the position, the uh, lift to the highest position in order to allow the swing bridge to swing underneath. So they had to keep this. They wanted to build the bridge as close to the original bridge as possible so they could utilize the same roadways, but also needed to keep that bridge in operation. And so basically the other swing bridge swung right in between the two towers of our current lift bridge. Once the lift span was in place, they did about three months of equipment testing. And on December 20th, 1959, they opened the lift bridge to uh, vehicle traffic. And the next, very next day, they started demolishing the old swing bridge. They removed the automobile approaches first, and then uh, a couple months later, they finally were able to switch the rail over that was slightly delayed and then they started removing everything else um, the only thing that was remaining by the spring was a swing span just because they needed to get into the canal to remove everything and they couldn't do that when it was still frozen uh, there were stories as we talked to one of the original construction managers there um, how they were not gentle with the old bridge they would just cut pieces off and let it fall crashing to the ice and then drag it away so that was just kind of a fun tidbit. 
Uh, they had their ribbon cutting ceremony in the summer of that year that, that it opened. Um, and at that point, it was completely open. It had tripled the car capacity. It had shorter and fewer delays. It had the unique intermediate position, which we'll talk more about later. Um, the opening was more than double the width that it had before with the swing bridge, as you can kind of see in that top left picture there with the swing bridge and the lift bridge. Um, they had full pedestrian and rail access at all times. Um, the And then kind of stepping away from the construction into the final years of the, or more recent years of the bridge, not final. Um, on September 28th, the last train went across the lower deck. Um, at that point, the mining community was kind of um, done. There wasn't really a lot of mining done at that time. And so trains were not as needed for the area. So they removed a lot of the rails and such leading up to the bridge and everything. Um, however, the lower deck is now used for snowmobiles, which we'll kind of touch on later. Um, in 2015 to 16, they did the first major rehabilitation of the bridge. Um, and they did things like just checking over the overall structure and doing some multi-year fixes on your standard um, maintenance, maintenances for mechanical uh, processes. And then currently they're working on replacing finger joints, which you can see in the lower right picture there. And uh, they're going to be replacing the actual lift motors for the first time uh, this winter once they lower the bridge um, with, the, with the freezing of the canal. And so that's kind of a, a timeline and history of the Portage Lake crossing as well as our current lift bridge. So getting into a little bit about what makes this bridge unique, it's a double deck vertical lift bridge, which is the only one of its type in the state of Michigan, and then also just a really uncommon type nationwide. Um, the research for this project only turned up a handful of other double deck vertical lift bridges that are still in use uh, in the US today. Um, most of the bridges of this type are either replaced or converted into pedestrian and bicycle bridges. Um, but in contrast, this one, as Michael just talked about, is really well maintained and and really sees a high level of use, even in comparison to other non-vertical lift bridges um, and historic bridges in the state of Michigan, like the Mackinac Bridge, the Blue Water Bridge, or the International Bridge. Uh, another fun fact about this bridge is at the time of its construction, it had the heaviest lift span in the world at 4,584,000 pounds. And that's due to its double deck, where it had vehicles on the top and then those really heavy mining trains on the bottom. So another part of this nomination package was to find a list of comparable projects and then kind of compare and contrast them with the Portage Lake Bridge to see how the Portage Lake Bridge did or didn't stand out. And so each of these was chosen because they highlighted a different aspect of the Portage Lake Bridge. On the top left, we have the Armour Swift Burlington Bridge, which was built in Kansas City in 1911. And at the time of our writing the nomination package, it was the only other vertical lift bridge uh, on the ASC National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark list. And while it's really cool, it's a telescoping vertical lift bridge, um, it also showed that there weren't any other similar bridges that had received this award yet. And there weren't any other bridges that could showcase the Portage Lake Bridge's unique civil engineering achievements. Uh, next, we have the Duluth Aerial Lift Bridge, which was built in 1905 as a transporter bridge. So it had a little gondola that would ferry people back and forth. And then it was converted to a vertical lift bridge that you see in that photo in um, 1921. And so located in Duluth, Minnesota, which is over 200 miles west of Houghton, it's the closest vertical lift bridge to the Portage Lake Bridge uh, and shows that very few vertical lift bridges are still in use in the area, let alone double deck vertical lift bridges. And then on the right here, we have the Sarah Mildred Long Bridge its original iteration, which was a double deck vertical lift bridge built in 1940. And then on the bottom, you see its replacement, which was built in 2018. Um, the top photo with the old bridge really shows that this double deck style is going out of style. Um, it's not really useful anymore in most cases, except for particularly for the Houghton and Hancock communities where it's been really a, a really great asset. Um, the new Sarah Mildred Long Bridge was really innovative in that it's a 
innovative precast concrete towers and a steel box girder lift span. And it still has double decks, but as you can see that it only has one lift span deck. And so unlike the Portage Lake Bridge, it doesn't have quite the same versatility of you know, number of modes of transportation it can accommodate all at once. So accommodating lots of modes of transportation is really where the Portage Lake Bridge shines. Um, in its fully closed position, it's got its upper deck open for vehicles, its lower deck open for rail, and then its waterway is closed to most watercraft, although you can usually fit you know, smaller things like kayaks and canoes underneath it. Um, I did say open to rail on the lower deck, but nowadays they don't use it for rail anymore, they use it for snowmobiles. So just a fun little tidbit about living in the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, next, we have the intermediate position where the upper deck is going to be open for vehicles. Your lower deck is closed to rail or snowmobiles. And then the waterway is open for small to medium craft. And this is the position that the bridge sits in for the summer months in Houghton. And then finally, we have the open position where the upper and lower decks are both closed to land traffic, but then the waterway is open to uh, larger marine traffic. And this is the only position that this bridge has where it's only available to one mode of transportation. So talking more about this intermediate position, this was as far as we could find the first time this position had ever been used. And that, what I mean when I say intermediate position is where the lift span is partially raised so the bottom deck of the lift span functions as part of the upper roadway deck. And doing this reduced the number of bridge openings by 63% in comparison to the previous swing bridge. And with the significance of all the industries north of the bridge that Michael talked about, and then the frequent use of the bridge by locals going between the towns of Houghton and Hancock, being able to reduce the number of bridge openings had a really positive impact on the flow of people and goods across Portage Lake. So to make this intermediate position function, there were two additional innovations that needed to happen. First of all, there needed to be a way to accommodate both rail and automobiles on the bottom deck of the lift span. And we were able to interview an engineer who worked at Hazlett and Erdahl, the design company, who told us that they had to experiment with a couple of different materials and solutions to properly embed the rails within the drivable surface of the lower deck, because that wasn't really something that was done in the 50s when this was getting designed. And then second of all, the bridge required movable intermediate bridge seats. So in a typical vertical lift bridge, the lift span is held up by a mechanical means when it's raised, and then it rests on bridge seats when it's lowered. Those bridge seats are the components that the lift span bears on its resting position, and they're usually located at the top of the piers at each corner of the lift span. And so in that sketch on the bottom left, those would be those gray rectangles. Um, for safety and efficiency reasons, the fixed and intermediate positions both require the lift span to be resting on supports instead of being fully supported by the counterweights and machinery used to move the span. Um, but if you look at where those red lines are, those are representing the intermediate uh, bridge seats. If the supports for the intermediate position were fixed, they would prevent the lift span from moving freely up and down. And so the solution to this was to use a system of hydraulics and rollers to be able to move these bridge seats in and out uh, from underneath the fixed span of the bridge to support the lift span when it's in its intermediate position. And if any of you guys are in the area of Houghton Hancock, in the wintertime, you can actually walk underneath the bridge and go look at these intermediate bridge seats. And it's pretty cool. They're these really gigantic built up sections um, that you can walk right up and, and take a look at. So on the construction side of things, there were also a number of civil engineering innovations, um, namely the construction of the lift span. So the lift span, as Michael mentioned, was built on land and then floated into place using barges using a technique now known as a bridge slide. And although this was probably not the first time this technique was used in the US, it was completed a lot earlier than any other bridge slides, slide projects that we were able to uncover in our research. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, and the reason that they did this for this project is because the old steel swing bridge needed to remain functional. Um, and the old and the new bridges, as Michael mentioned, they were built so close together that if the lift span was built in place, they would no longer be able to have uh, water traffic going through the portage, which would be really problematic. So you can see in this photo on the right here, the 
truss coming out from the right hand of the photo is actually the swing span of the old swing bridge extending between the towers of the new lift bridge that's under construction there. Um, and so the solution to that was to build a lift span in Houghton and then float it into place over one morning. And they did that using a system of barges and tugboats. Part of what made this so impressive is they only had four inches of clearance on each end of the 260 foot lift span. So they had to be really precise, even though this thing was really massive and really, really heavy. Once they maneuvered it into place, they attached it to the towers and then raised it up to its fully open position so they could continue to use the roadway while they finished up all the remaining things they had to do for the bridge. Uh, interestingly though, because the lift span was not fully complete when they floated it into place, it didn't weigh as much as its finished weight and didn't properly balance with the counterweights, which more or less weighed their finished weight. And so to make them balance properly and not put too much reliance on all the mechanical systems, they put these two barges on the top of the lift span and filled them with water. So you can see those in that picture on the left there, those two boxes on top of the lift span. Those are those barges filled with water to make it properly balance with the counterweights. So kind of rounding out the importance of the bridge, we needed to talk about the social and economic significance because um, it's important to the civil engineering community for all the reasons that Emma just mentioned, but it's also important to uh, the local community as well as the nation because um, bridges, you know, they bridge gaps and kind of connect people together. So it was very significant, as I kind of mentioned before, to move copper from um, one side of the country or one side of the, the canal to the other, which then went all over the country that later shifted to lumber, which is still heavily um, taken out of the area. As you can see on the right, there is a lumber uh, truck crossing. Um, if you were in the area, I'd be very surprised if you don't see half a dozen lumber trucks uh, going right past you. Um, it made a very efficient crossing at a transportation bottleneck. This is the only crossing for people to get from one side, one part of the peninsula to the other, meaning that all vehicle, all um, snowmobile, all pedestrians need to go across this bridge to get there. Um, the waterway was also important to the, was important to the copper industry as well as the iron industry on the Western Superior and Duluth area. Um, Large ships, especially back when the bridge was first built, would often take refuge in the canal because it would be um, much calmer waters during storms and such, and it would also cut off having to go all the way around. We still see a few freighters go through today, so to, and they do still harbor around the canal when it's uh, very uh, rough out on Superior. Um, pedestrians walk across the bridge daily between these two towns. Um, and then back when rail was going across that carried both copper and people, there was a good uh, pedestrian line as well. And then today we have a lot of tourism. We have people coming up to learn about the copper history as well as the different industries that were up here. And some of them still are up here like logging. And then since the shift from industrial, we also now have a lot of nature um, that people come up here to do, um, like the snowmobiling and and four-wheeling and all that kind of stuff and hiking and everything you can think of involving nature people come up here and so the bridge is still heavily crossed as emma pointed out earlier more than a lot of other bridges and so kind of to conclude everything uh the porridge lake bridge is a unique double deck lift bridge that we believe uh needed some recognition uh, from the ASE as it was important to both civil engineering and kind of the nation's social and economic situations. Uh, it replaced a deficient steel swing bridge that had been in place for over 60 years at the time. It had a, the heaviest lift span in the world at that time, which is quite a feat in itself. Um, the intermediate position was revolutionary for the time period and even today is still uh, quite rare to find the a similar a deck used for multiple purposes like rail and vehicles kind of thing and it, it connected the Keweenaw to the rest of the country and then we have successfully been recognized as an ASC civil engineering 
landmark at the state level as well as the national. And so we're excited about that. And we will be having uh, the dedication ceremony on June 16th, or actually on June 17th, but the festivals from June 16th to 19th. But on June 17th, we'll be having the dedication ceremony for the, the plaque and everything. And Emma and I will be, and other people will be giving presentations about the bridge that weekend as well. And now we're open for questions. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Emma. Um, I'm just going to pause for a minute and let people ask any questions they have. I do see one. Go ahead. I do see one question in the chat. It's from Therese. She says, does any local museum have parts from the street from the swing bridge? Yes, uh, the Houghton County uh, Historical Museum, which is over in Lake Linden. Um, uh, it's on the north side of the canal. Um, they actually have uh, a couple pieces, uh, some of the like cornice or decoration decorative pieces from the top of the swing bridge and it says I think it says like Portage Lake Bridge or something like that on it so there is a little a little piece of it um, there's rumors of some of the steel pieces since they didn't really care about them uh, at that time they would get taken by local people to uh, build things with so they would take either some trusses or just random steel pieces and you know, build their warehouse, their barn out of it or something like that. So there's pieces around rumored in the q and but as far as uh, go and find a specific piece, there is there is one piece, at least at the Houghton County Historical Museum. Interesting. There's more questions coming in. So John Kosel asked, what was the cost of making the bridge? Ooh, Emma you might have to help me, but I believe it was 11 million at the time. That sounds right, but I'm trying to look it up right now. I know we have all of our documents for our nomination package here, so I'm rooting around. Okay. Yeah, it's less than you think, but it's also or more, less than it feels like nowadays, but obviously 11 million was a lot more back then. And they spend, they spend more than that currently on the repairs. So like the the 2015 to 16 repairs cost more than the original bridge to build. Speaking of repairs, how often does the bridge get repainted? That's another question from John. Okay. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, they do spot painting every once in a while. It's not quite a regiment like people hear about with the Mackinac Bridge where you they get they go from one end to the other and then they turn around and start back at the other side because um, it's not it's not quite that long. So they typically do some spot painting um, and especially for long, large repairs like this, they truly kind of look over everything and you can see different places where they they spot paint. But um, there's. I, I at least haven't seen them do any like true, we're going to scrape the tower and repaint it kind of things. So I think it's mostly spot painting at this point. I don't know if you guys noticed from the photos, though, um, some of the older ones from the 80s, they had it painted gray. And then I guess fairly recently it was it was converted to this blue and white color scheme that you see now. Yeah, I think the the piece, the original steel pieces came in like an orange color with some kind of protective coating from the factory. And then, like Emma said, they painted it silver for a while or gray. And then they painted it the, the blue and cream color, which we heard was to match the, the Isle Royal Ranger boat. And so the boat that takes everyone out to Isle Royal. Um, which I guess I don't think we had any colored pictures of it, but if you look up the, the Ranger, you'll see that it matches the bridge. So that's kind of cute. <laughs> you got to pick the color. That was also the first boat to go <laughs> under the new bridge, too. So. 
Interesting. Okay, next question um, from Joe. What was the bridge paid for with state or federal funds? Um, I believe it was a kind of a combination. Um, it was a lot of uh, more federal funds, I believe, just because it was a water, it went over a heavily used waterway um, that, you know, benefits the, you know, Canada and other states. And so it wasn't just a state of Michigan um, issue. And like I kind of alluded to the, the the whole reason they could get funding is because they, the Lake Carrier Association, uh, proved that it was a um, unreasonable obstruction to free navigation, um, and the Lake Carrier Association covers like everyone who travels the, the Great Lakes, and so it was a good amount of state funding, also a good amount of federal. I'm not sure the exact percentages anymore. Um, there was also some input from the rail companies uh, that were using it at the time. And so they also put in some funding and for a while they actually uh, ran the bridge. So they were the people who paid to have somebody in the operation booth. Um, and then eventually it was turned over to MDOT. But, yeah. All right, I'm gonna see if anyone is unmuting to ask a question. I'll just pause for a second. Okay. Anyone? Otherwise, I'm going to mute you. <laughs> All right. Next question from the chat box is from John Kozel. Is the view from the top awesome? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it definitely is. <laughs> I yeah, I haven't personally uh, been up there yet, but oh, cool. uh, hey, hopefully we did a tour. Remember? Not not the top of the tower. Oh, that's true. So, so the, all the mechanical equipment, one interesting thing about this bridge is all the mechanical equipment to raise and lower the, the lift span is actually in the towers. Um, so Michael's right. We were able to go up in the towers and like see all the mechanical equipment, but not, we didn't go all the way to the top. So like the roof. Yeah. maybe when you're there this summer, you can ask. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah, probably dangerous. <laughs> Uh, but it, yeah. it's cool. It's a very, I mean, it's one of the higher points in the area and you can kind of, you can look really far down the canal and such. And so certainly a nice view. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, last question from John is, has the bridge ever been stuck in between two positions? I think the um, answer is probably yes. <laughs> probably. Um, the bridge definitely gets stuck sometimes and backs up traffic, which is annoying. Um, but on that British tour I just mentioned, we actually were told that everything for raising and lowering lift span can actually be done by hand. So if any of the mechanical equipment or electricity were to fail, um, somebody would literally be able to climb up in the towers and operate everything by hand to, you know, maybe if the lift span got out of whack and one end was higher than the other and you know got itself stuck that way, there would be able to be somebody to go up there and fix it all by hand, even if it took longer than it normally would. Yeah, they, there's all sorts of gadgets and, you know, sensors and things that show, like, is the bridge level? Is it tilting left or right, you know, front to back or anything like that? Or not the bridge itself, but the lift, the lift span. And yeah, when we were there, one of the guys who some he's like the mechanic guy was there telling us things. And I think he did say that he's had to go up there and like into the towers and manually like crank one end of the bridge up just because, you know, sometimes you can only get so precise with the motors and such. And so he just had to go and crank it one way or something like that. And um, yeah, so. This is kind of a, a fun fact is that if the bridge was completely cut off from all power, it could still be lifted by hand. You could move the inter intermediate bridge speed seats. You could, you know, turn the cranks at the top of the towers. You can so you can you can operate it if you needed to by a, just a team of people. But now it's just needed. Now it's just used for, you know, fine tuning. Well, awesome. I have. I have one of my own questions, um, and maybe you already answered this um, if I was busy doing some 
by Steph, but how often does the bridge change position from like the intermediate to open or close? How often do they do that? It, it varies. Um, in the summer, it, like Emma said, it sits pretty much in the intermediate position to allow most, most boats to go through. Um, and like, and we only use the bottom deck for snowmobiles now. And so in the summer, they don't need that lowered for that. And so it sits in that intermediate position. So cars can go across and small boats can go underneath. And the biggest thing now that it moves for during the summer is that there's uh, a lot of sailboats in the area. And so um, they'll raise it up for sailboats. I want to say probably five, between five and 10 times a day, they'll raise it for sailboats. Um, and obviously that's dependent on, you know, how many people are out that day or anything like that. <laughs> um, and then in the winter, it doesn't move at all because uh, nobody's using the waterway. Um, and then occasionally in the summer, it goes down all of the way either for maintenance or um, the lift bridge actually has, um, if you can kind of see the picture that's sitting up here, there's the operation booth is kind of that little rectangle. It's um, behind the road signs. Um, between the road deck and the operations booth, there's only 14 feet of clearance, which if anyone's a bridge mm -hmm. engineer, you know that that's actually pretty low for bridges nowadays. And so sometimes there's, there's uh, trucks that are carrying too high of a load. And so what they actually do is they lower the bridge and take them onto the rail deck because that one has like 18 plus feet of clearance. And so they'll divert them down and take them under there to get the high load uh, trucks across. But that's kind of rare. But that's that's the other reason it might be down all the way in the summer. And one of the few reasons it's down all the way in the summer. So. So complicated. <laughs> Very yeah. cool. Very cool. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> All right, let me read this um, last one. Will the presentation be available to watch online? Um, yes, Paul, we will. That leads me to my last uh, closing statement that where PDH certificates will be sent out to your emails and the recordings will be posted to our YouTube page per usual. So that email should co contain the link to our YouTube page and we'll post this um, recording as well. I just wanna thank our speakers once again, Michael and Emma, uh, it was so nice to have you today. It looks like you got a few people um, responding in the chat. It was a great presentation and uh, it, it looks like we should all get together in June to celebrate the bridge again. So it'll be a nice summer trip. Um, again, thank you all for coming and check, check for your emails. If you don't get those, you can contact me, Rebecca Walters, and um, I'll send you some information. And thank you again for coming today. We look forward to seeing you next month virtually. And in the meantime, have a great Christmas and happy new year. Thank you everyone. Thank you, y'all. Thanks, everyone.